Welcome to Perspectives Online, also on air from WFSU Public Media. I'm Tom Flanagan. This program, using the Zoom platform, as has become traditional now, was pre-recorded on Tuesday, October 13th for playback on Thursday, October 15th, with the show appearing on both WFSU-FM and the WFSU Public Media Facebook page. Well, the COVID pandemic has prompted many kind of, if, if you like that kind of humor, some uh, humorous references to the increase in alcohol consumption by folks working from home who no longer have to worry much about getting fired for drinking on the job. But the statistics that are connected to this and some other substance issues are no laughing matter. They're really not. The Journal of the American Medical Association just this week uh, has reported the consumption of alcoholic beverages is up among adults by 14%. It, up and down in various demographics, but that's the overall. And that figure came out before bars and restaurants began reopening aggressively around the country. Meanwhile, also from the journal, more than 40 states have reported increases in opioid-related mortality, as well as ongoing concerns for those with a mental illness or substance use disorder. Here in Florida's Big Bend, local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies are reporting increasing traffic in methamphetamines, among other drugs. And it appears that substance abuse, already a significant societal problem, is in many instances getting worse. We've got a great panel to talk about all of this today. So let's uh, go across the screen and, and meet everybody. First, uh, we say hello to Kathleen Roberts, Executive Director of the Community Coalition Alliance. Kathleen, thank you for being part of the discussion today. Thank you so much for having me. This is a great pleasure. Not too often do we have generals who check in to perspectives. And so we are honored beyond description to welcome uh, a real general, General Arthur Dean of the uh, Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, CADCA, I think is the, uh, the acronym on that. Uh, general, so good to see you, sir. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for the opportunity. Joe Davis, an old friend of ours uh, from the Florida Alliance of Boys and Girls Clubs, is also a member of this panel here today. And Joe, we appreciate your participation as well. Thanks for having me, Tom. We have a member of the Florida legislature checking in, Representative Colleen Burton, Republican from Polk County. And Representative, thank you for being part of this as well. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be part of the conversation. And this is not only a Florida connected situation. We, we go far afield sometimes on this program, all the way to Spartanburg, South Carolina, where we will meet Dr. Greg Colbath. He's an orthopedic surgeon practicing up there. Doctor, thank you for being part of this as well. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, certainly an interstate uh, issue, if not a national issue as well. Well, as long as we're in your, uh, and, uh, in your office, I guess, uh, doctor, talk a little bit about, uh, we mentioned what we heard from the Journal of the American Medical Association here, those kind of frightening stats that were coming out here this week. But what are, what are you seeing, even in the orthopedic practice, how pervasive is substance abuse now? And is it getting worse you know, across all facets or selective demographics? Or what are you seeing? Certainly. So uh, it's not surprising to see that the uh, opioid uh, overdose numbers have increased during the era of COVID. Um, but I started this about five years ago, really started having a, a preemptive discussion with my patients prior to surgery. And five years ago, when I would discuss this, it was, uh, it was something that was, uh, the patients say, there's not an opioid issue here in our, our community. And I started using that opportunity to highlight to them that, yes, I, I would, would be giving them medications, but we would uh, obviously try to take care of their pain after the surgery. And surprisingly, 99% of surgical procedures, that if, if you go in for a surgery, you're going to wind up getting some form of narcotic prescribed to you. And so that's where uh, this, these you know, incredible amounts of unused pills have been floating around. Um, in fact, we had about 3 billion pills that are floating around our nation right now that have been prescribed legally by a physician, but are just kind of waiting to be uh, found by somebody for misuse or abuse. And unfortunately, 
um, you know, I saw that happening more and more often with some of my patients and I had heard about these stories. So I took it upon myself to really have that discussion preemptively with my patients prior to going to surgery and saying, yes, we're going to take care of your pain, but we're going to try to do this in a thoughtful manner. And we're going to use lots of strategies. We're going to have this discussion ahead of time. And we are going to make sure that we control your pain. But that doesn't mean that um, there's not an onus upon the patient to try to get off the medications as soon as possible. And then also responsibly d dispose of the medications afterwards. Because the last thing we want is... Um, for these patients just to put the pills in their medicine cabinet or their dot kit for a rainy day. And that's where the, the potential for misuse and abuse really comes about. And um, so that's what we've, we've really hearkened on and, and uh, made some great strides. And I can say that over the last four or five years, uh, it's, it's been a very positive thing, a very positive change for my office and the patients have been very receptive to it. Um, I thought it was gonna be a hard ask, but it has been nothing but positive, so. Yeah, and on the part of other practitioners, has that become more of an awareness factor as well, that instead of the knee jerk, oh, we're just going to go ahead and prescribe these things, and oh, you need a 90-day supply, no problem, we're writing that puppy up right now, to be a bit more circumspect about how they get prescribed. Absolutely, and, and, the, and the press has done an incredible job of, of highlighting uh, you know, what, what an incredible crisis this is and put a lot of pressure, PR pressure on, on companies. I mean, three years ago, who would have thought that Purdue would be filing for bankruptcy? I uh, just read last week, or this week, where Mallinckrodt, also one of the opioid uh, makers, is also filing for Chapter 11. So we've come a long way, and I think the public perception on this, they, they understand that this affects every single community. This isn't just you know, urban communities, this is rural communities, this is, everyone's been affected and everyone, if you really dig deep, uh, has had some family member or uh, employee or somebody who's been affected by this. So uh, we understand the, the need for this. Representative Colleen Burton, uh, bouncing off of uh, Dr. Colbath's description there, a uh, statement of problem, if you remember when we were back in college and we'd always start that off at the beginning of the course here. The Florida legislature has tried to respond to this situation in recent years as well. I recall the pill mills down in, in Central and South Florida and how that became such a huge problem. The legislature jumped in and tried to get a handle on that and put some new restrictions on. What's our current situation here in Florida regarding the law when it comes to these kinds of things? Certainly it's interesting. I wrote a note as the doctor was speaking and I wrote pill mill. <laughs> because to your point, um, it was a large problem here in the state of Florida. And so with when uh, Pam Bonney was our attorney general, you know, General Bondi looked at it from a largely um, law enforcement point of view, if you will, but also knew that we had issues here in the state of Florida as, and this became an issue that was prominent within the legislature over the last few years of physicians, to, your, to the doctor's point, Physicians would, would prescribe the allowable amount of uh, narcotic to a patient, to his point, normally after surgery or some other procedure. And, and sadly enough, what we now know, and we, we know from working with organizations like Rally and other community organizations across our state and other states, is that that sadly sometimes is somebody's entree, if you will, into an addiction. And it's a very scary thing. They don't know it, right? They, they take it for a legitimate reason and then they end up having lifetime problems or potentially lifetime problems. So what the Florida legislature has done working with physicians and others across our state is, you know, a statute now in Florida, we limit the number of pills that can be you know, dispensed in an initial prescription. And then quite, and at first we got some pushback just from people in the community who I think didn't understand it, but it's intended to make sure that if somebody um, starts with their limited amount, maybe three days, I believe, and not, I hate to quote the statute, but I'm pretty positive that's what it is. You know, you, you have to go back and you have to get a renewal from your, um, the right, the physician who wrote that prescription to continue that. And I understand, and I do get, we did get some pushback when we initially passed that legislation from people who didn't understand. It did, doesn't mean people who take other prescription medicine, medicines who have chronic ongoing pain well, they do have to get their prescription renewed more often as well. But for folks who get addicted to these uh, to opioids, often it's because of an acute pain, right? It, it's because of a post-surgical procedure or, pro, or, or excuse me, post-surgical incident or post-procedure incident. So we've done what we can do. 
And I also think, but I think the important part of this is too, you know, we can only do so much. I know you'll probably talk about this a little bit, but later on, but for us, it's looking at what can we do legislatively? Well, we know that there are criminal penalties related to pill mills. There are things that we have in place. We track, we track um, prescriptions in Florida more than perhaps I know, more than we used to do, but probably more than other states do as well. So the physician can go in and see perhaps if the individual they're writing that prescription for, well, they may have gotten a similar prescription and you know, not too long ago from another physician and allows our, our pharmacies can track as well as our physicians so that when they write those prescriptions, the intent would be they're not continuing to supply somebody with a potentially and oftentimes addictive drug. So we, we have now a more robust legal infrastructure in place to discourage these kinds of things. However, addictions, of course, still go on. You had mentioned representative uh, community groups. Kathleen Roberts, let's talk about the Community Coalition Alliance. Tell us a bit about your organization and what it does. Absolutely. So we are a coalition of coalitions. While typically a local community coalition has memberships that include health um, providers, it includes schools, law enforcement, we're kind of the aggregate view of that. So each of our members represent the leads of the local county level coalitions. We provide a voice for a unified approach to looking at community prevention, and we cover coalitions across the Northeast region as well as the Southeast region. This way we can come together, identify those best practices, look at ways to have that consistent messaging, look at ways that we can really leverage the work that we do, because while we do have county borders, they're really on paper. You know, our, our folks go from one county to the other and sometimes you can't tell. So the more we work together, the better it's going to be. Some of the things that we're working on to help address that community perspective is to really increase the awareness increase the knowledge regarding um, prescription drug misuse, underage drinking, whatever the substance is that's affecting a particular community. Uh, we can tell you that definitely prescription drug misuse continues to be a top priority um, as we're seeing within the different um, data points that we have, the research that's out there, you know, finding that maybe about 60% of folks that are prescribed pain medications for pain relief uh, still have leftover medications. And then if we add that and knowing that about you know, 2,400 youth start off with um, using a prescription drug to begin experimenting and going down there. And now we've got COVID where we're at home more often, where we have more uh, availability and access to the, the medicine cabinet, where we have um, sometimes less supervision, even though there was youth are at home because parents are returning back to work and many uh, school districts or families have decided to continue virtual school. So now we're at home with that access. And then we also have not just the prescription medication, but we've looked at what are some of the issues surrounding some of the alcohol delivery services that are available. So that's becoming something that's easily accessible. Add some medication with me, we get you a perfect storm for uh, issues to continue to grow rather than um, shrink. So with the education that we do, uh, we try to give out that consistent um, communication and messaging around what safe storage looks like, what safe disposal looks like. And thanks to um, partners like uh, Raleigh, Florida, we were able to receive donations for deterra bags, which are the drug deactivation kits that not only um, deactivate the medication, uh, whether it's an opioid, whether it's a stimulant, whether it's an um, antibiotic, it just completely deactivates it and then we can throw it away in the trash without an environmental concern. So we can be able to provide that across our communities. And with COVID again, it's making our community events a little bit trickier since uh, we can't have large gatherings. So we're exploring things of like these virtual platform opportunities where we can do town halls and have people call in and hear about this. We can send out information. We can join up with things that are happening like uh, the food distribution sites to be able to share that information to go out to the homes. Um, to work with the different schools. Uh, our schools in Florida have a requirement and rule to be able to provide substance abuse prevention education. So now that we have that opportunity, we can kind of combine our forces and really leverage the work that we do. And so we are continuing to kind of bring that attention, um, share the data. I don't think we, all of our communities realize just how much of an impact substance use has and that it affects just about every type of family that's out there. It doesn't target a specific type of group. It is 
across the board. So the more information we can provide, the better equipped we are to be able to overcome it. And then also look at, are there policies in our area that we need to address? Are there things that we can do working with our physicians to share more information about safe disposal? Are there other opportunities with partners like our law enforcement to share information about Narcan, to give that out to the communities? Are there opportunities for us to really engage our schools of how do we, uh, for those that are still in the virtual arena, what are some things to look out for as you're engaging with students um, during a virtual screen? You don't have them in person, so you don't have as much contact, but there's still things that we can look for and look at. And then also, how do we engage our businesses? Like we're seeing that increase in alcohol delivery services, the move for our temporary allowance for alcohol to go drinks. And so what are some things we need to put in place? Because that compliance checks that, you know, you go to a store and make sure you're not selling to underage. How does that apply when it's a home delivery service? So that's the type of work our different groups work in, our coalitions, you know, reach out across our different partnerships. And, you know, this is something that it's going to take all of us coming together. We all play a role. It's just figuring out how do we all fit in that role working together. You mentioned, Kathleen, that these problems do not start or stop at a county line. They also don't stop at a state line. So if we could ask uh, you to jump in here, General Arthur Dean, uh, how does CADCA, Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, your organization, interface and intersect with all of this? Well, <clears throat> thanks for the opportunity. Uh, CADCA is a, a national organization. In fact, we're international. Uh, we started back in 1992, came out of a presidential commission. The epidemic then was cocaine, as you remember. Uh, and now, obviously, it's other substances. Uh, and we have built a network of community coalitions all across the United States and in 30 countries around the world. And our network exceeds 5,000 community coalitions. Um, what we do is help them on a multi-sector, multi-strategy basis, uh, similar to what uh, Kathleen was talking about at the local level, bringing together all of the sectors to work in a holistic way to go about identifying the risk factors in their communities and addressing them while emphasizing the factors that are gonna prevent substance use. And we primarily work on the substance use prevention side, but we understand the importance of treatment as well as recovery. So we address those issues as well. What we've been doing um, is, um, particularly after COVID-19 hit us, is uh, using the platform, obviously, that we're on today to help our coalitions. And we learned from our friends at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, part of the NIH, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, that people who, are who have a problem, a substance use disorder, are more likely and more susceptible to the effects of COVID-19 uh, um, and may face additional problems and struggles in trying to maintain their sobriety. And that's because of the physical separation uh, and the lack of community that COVID-19 is bringing to us. Uh, and you've heard some information, but um, uh, SAMHSA tells us through their research that uh, of those that get involved with opioids, 64.6% of them get them from family and friends. So as you heard the doctor indicate, there are lots of un medicines that are prescribed that go unused. In fact, working with the Food and Drug Administration, it tells us that about 75% nearly 75% of all prescriptions written go unused. So therefore, working with uh, Raleigh, we have been able to go into 14 states now. And as Kathleen has said, we've been into the state of Florida as well. Uh, we have distributed um, about 750,000 of these material pouches not just in Florida, but across the United States, all designed to get these unwanted, unused medicines out of homes, out of medicine cabinets, so they will not be abused and they be environmentally and friendly disposed of. Uh, it is critical that we do that. Um, and another real important concern is that, that we know from recent data from the Center for Disease Control, 
Uh, their initial look at um, this year only showed a 5% increase in opioid overdose, but they anticipate when they finish the second half of 2020, that that 5% could grow to 20 or 25%. So we're really worried that the progress that we made when we had the huge number of overdose in 2017, and we began to see the curve go down, that that curve in fact is back up again uh, because of the issues associated with COVID-19, the isolation, uh, the, um, and we have, a, we have a few doctors and, and Dr. Kopet might know this better than I, but we also hear from our coalitions that some physicians are beginning to violate the laws that the representative talked about and prescribing for a longer period of time because they don't want to inconvenience their patient during COVID-19 to come back for a refill. So therefore there's a greater supply of medicines in homes as well. And uh, there's lots more to talk about what's going on from a national level, but basically many of the gains that we have achieved are beginning to be eroded. And in fact, overdoses are up, suicides are up, mental health issues are up, and we have lots of problems, not just in Florida, but across the U.S. that we're going to have to deal with. Thank you, General. Uh, uh, before we get to you, Abby, since you were uh, name checked at Cold Bath, uh, we'll throw it back to you in a second. But Joe Davis, as far as the multi generational aspects of this are concerned, I saw something just this past week in which some school districts are telling parents, caregivers for kids hey, could you just chill a little bit while the kids are trying to do their lessons? Because we can see what y'all are doing back there on the couch. <laughs> so, you know, could y'all put down the bongs and and quit day drinking? Because number one, it's uh, you know a real bad example for the children, but you're also freaking out the teachers. Stop that. That behavior really isn't uh, acceptable, whether it's in real school or in virtual school. Have you heard any of those kind of stories? So, Tom, thank you. Thanks for letting me be here today. And, and um, I have a, have a few things I wanted to touch on from the other uh, panelists. But to answer that question directly uh, is, yes, yeah, so we, you know, we see e-learning uh, as a, a real challenge for our uh, youth. And, and uh, you know, whether it's the challenge of, of e-learning itself and just a child sitting in front of a computer trying to figure things out, you know, or the challenge of a, um, lack of support, or even further than that, um, you know, parents or others in the home, uh, while a student is trying to uh, e-learn, um, uh, where those parents are engaged in things they shouldn't be doing uh, that are harmful to our kids. And so we are seeing that um, uh, from, uh, you know, from our Boys and Girls Clubs. Um, I have the privilege of representing uh, over 212,000 kids in Florida that, that um, I participate in our members in, within Boys and Girls Clubs uh, all around the state. We have 33 organizations. And in our Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, safety is priority one. Um, and substance abuse and uh, opioid uh, abuse in particular uh, has become a real priority uh, of our clubs. In fact, it's, a, it's mandated uh, that all of our clubs have uh, some level of opioid uh, abuse prevention programming is part of the funding that we get graciously from the state of Florida. Uh, Representative Burton, thank you for uh, the funds that we get through the Department of Juvenile Justice and the Department of Education. But those DJJ dollars, part of those funds uh, go directly to uh, our clubs using a national resource guide on opioid uh, and substance abuse prevention, uh, where we're not only uh, providing uh, mentors to our youth, uh, but we're training staff uh, and that we're engaging this issue within the community. And so it's, it's such an important uh, thing for everyone to recognize. Uh, you know, we are, uh, the Florida Alliance of Boys and Girls Clubs is really happy to be working with uh, Rally Florida. Uh, we've received some funding. Uh, we're gonna hold a Facebook Live event uh, very soon where we're talking about the red flags uh, that parents can look for in their child's room. Um, uh, things that, uh, that, that are obvious 
um, uh, triggers to uh, that should be alarming that you know kind of lead to possible substance abuse uh, that may be very cleverly hidden. And so we're trying to better educate our families, uh, and then we're also educating our our youth uh, whether they have their own issues or there may be. Uh, their parents or other people within their homes have issues, uh, trying to make sure that they have the, the mental health um, uh, assistance and the tools that they need to be able to uh, survive those kinds of situations, whether it's personal to them uh, or a family member that they're dealing with. So we are seeing those things and our clubs are really um, uh, thoroughly engaged in trying to help uh, our youth navigate through, uh, their way through those waters. Yeah, besides trying to operate boys and girls clubs in an atmosphere where you have to have social distancing and mandatory masks and reduce the number of kids who are actually interacting. And if you try to get kids to stop interacting, it is a real challenge. They don't want to do that. It is tough. I can tell you that our clubs, um, uh, when the pandemic began, our clubs really quickly started serving the kids of first responders and doing it following all the CDC guidelines uh, that were out there. So now that uh, once June 1st came around and Florida began to open up a little bit, uh, uh, parents started going back to work. Uh, our clubs did open up at a limited capacity, again, following uh, those CDC guidelines, masks, social distancing uh, measures, washing hands relentlessly, uh, and, and employing those, um, uh, you know, those as effective measures to be able to fight COVID-19 as best as possible. Um, uh, General Dean mentioned it earlier, though, about you know, the concerns that we have over the lack of community. And one of the things that we found is, is for an organization like the Boys and Girls Clubs or the WISE or anyone else that are serving kids, uh, particularly in an out-of-school time capacity, um, that it's really important for them to see each other. And what we have to do is just make, uh, take all the precautions that we can uh, but still allow them to be able to have that uh, physical interaction, even if it's from a little further distance than they're used to. Uh, that it's, it's important for uh, that mental health uh, uh, element of a, of, a, of a child just being a kid. And Boys and Girls Clubs are, are really happy and proud to be able to provide them that, uh, that safe place to be in. And so often we have heard from a lot of folks on this program over the past several months, isolation is the mind killer. If I can pull a line from Dune there, that exacerbates just about any kind of negative situation. So thank you, Joe, for bringing that up. Quick reminder here, this is a very special uh, perspectives from WFSU Public Media. We are talking about the various ramifications of uh, substance abuse, not only in the era of COVID, but also just a sustaining problem for our society. If you miss all or part of any Perspectives program, it is available to you online, not only on our WFSU.org website, but also our WFSU Public Media Facebook page, so you can go back and listen and or view it as many times as you want. Uh, uh, Dr. Greg Colbath, let's talk a little bit about the, the actual nature of addiction. Still, as much information as has come out in recent years about the physiological response, what goes on in the brain when it comes to addictions, there is still a widespread perception on the part of a lot of folks, including including, sorry, Representative, a lot of policymakers, not you, but some of your colleagues, I'm sure you could relate to that, that it is still a character flaw. It is a personal failing. It is something deficient within us. What is addiction really from where you sit? Certainly. So aside from the medical description of it, uh, it is certainly not a moral failing. It is not a uh, character flaw. Um, but what I found was surprising when I kind of did a deep dive on this is that the addiction, the physical addiction that can occur from narcotics um, and these prescriptions that we're, we're prescribing for our patients, that can occur within four to five days. So if you think about these patients who I am intentionally giving these medications to, to, to help get them through their orthopedic procedure, whether it's a total shoulder or total knee, or for maybe a high school or maybe an ACL injury, They've never been exposed to, maybe they've never been exposed to narcotics, and we call that an opioid naive patient. And uh, now all of a sudden, I'm, I'm giving them a steady dose of narcotics, and so they could be potentially uh, physically addicted to this within four to five days. And that could 
And if they try to come off of that, then it could range, the symptoms and the side effects could range from you know, constipation, nausea, um, diarrhea, vomiting, all of these things, and irritability. I mean, all the things that you hear about with opioid um, prescriptions. And so that's why I, I highlight on the front end, before we take some of the surgery, say, this is, this is something I want you to get off of as soon as possible. Or... Uh, you know, sparingly use these. And I've even had patients who have been able to completely get through surgery, particularly if it's a minor surgery, or even if they're, we've really got a good program together, completely opioid free surgery. It can be done. And, 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 and what about patients? And what about patients who may already have a predisposition because of problems with other substances, be it drugs, alcohol, whatever? We've heard of addictive personalities. Is yeah. that really a thing? It is. And so obviously, if you have a patient and they, they come in and they're already um, on lots of medications or uh, you know, kind of a, a baseline of medications already that are uh, a, a potential mix for issues, I know postoperative. So if they're already on medications, narcotic medications that have been prescribed by their other doctor, uh, I know it's going to be a harder course to get them off of that afterwards, or it's going to be harder to, to control their pain after the surgery. So a lot of times I'll actually send them back to their treating physician who's been prescribing these, you know, if it was legitimate, uh, to say, hey, can we wean this patient down from their, their daily regimen currently in anticipation for surgery? And that would seem uh, sort of counterproductive, but actually what the studies have shown is that our pain control is, uh, is better treated and the patient's uh, post-operative experience is better. Um, and by having these discussions with a patient on the front end, maybe the patient doesn't realize it, but maybe their caregiver or their, their family members also say, yes, we've had some troubles with us in the past. This is something we're gonna, we're gonna take to heart and certainly uh, be mindful of. Um, so involving the family members and saying, hey, yes, we understand that you need some medication afterwards, but we're going to get you off as soon as possible and make this a better outcome. And when you outline it for the patients and for the family members that trust us on this, you're going to have a better outcome. And that's the whole goal. We want them to be uh, back to their function. We want them to go back to work or back to being a parent or a student. So those are the, those are the goals we have to set in place for those patients. And it's been very, very well received. Uh, my patients on average, I used to prescribe a lot more medications than I do now. And so by using these models, I've now uh, cut my pills that I prescribe now. Um, we're, my patients will use maybe about four or five pills afterwards on average. So it's really been heartening to see this and you know, some of the things that I put in place and hopefully other doctors will as well. So. Well, d despite these, these measures, which are certainly critical, from what we've kind of heard from everyone so far is that as long as we have circumstances, whether nationally or Florida specific, that are stressors causing more people to deal with issues that otherwise may not be consequential, the potential for substance abuse will probably remain at a higher level than, dare I say, normal times, whatever they are. Kathleen Roberts, what do you see happening for uh, Community co um, uh, Coalition Alliance as far as the need for your services is concerned? Uh, well, I think you mentioned something that is, was really critical right there, and that's the isolation part. COVID has really just amplified the same kind of triggers or the same kind of influencers that lead to substance misuse. And when we went down to the shutdown where everybody was uh, staying at home or schools were not in session, uh, and unemployment was going up, so folks were losing their jobs. Add all those different stressors to the mix, you are now amplifying the things that have an influence on someone's substance use. Um, taking a look at what we've seen here in the Jacksonville area, which is one of the communities that we work with, um, just at the beginning of the pandemic, the first three months, we saw a 40% increase in number of calls for overdose happening compared to the year before. And the difference was so much that if we took a look at all of the overdose calls received last year during the same time period, it was already surpassing just the opioid overdose calls of the same time period this year. So that right there is troubling enough. And we've also seen the outcomes of the Florida Youth Substance Abuse Survey, which is a survey done every year across our entire state. On um, certain years, it's at the county level, which this will be one of those years. And then the other years, it's just at the state. 
So that survey was completed right at the start of the pandemic. So we're seeing what was happening before all that isolation, before all those um, pieces that are really pushing the stressors happening. And already we were seeing a slight uptick change for middle school youth and their substance use, their self-reporting, especially for like the alcohol piece. And now that we were seeing what uh, is happening as a result of COVID, um, we're looking at other kinds of self-report surveys. And one of them looking at uh, American workers, that 3,000 of them found that one in three were reporting drinking during the day during work. Um, we see a number of other surveys that are being done of a lot of that self-report indicating increased use from previous months since pandemic hit for alcohol as well as marijuana, prescription drug misuse, all of those different pieces. The good part is we do have a lot of great community partners. Uh, we are fortunate in Florida to have the Florida National Guard counter drug program working with us. We're also fortunate to have the HIDA, the high intensity drug trafficking area as another fabulous partner to help us look at the data to help drive what we do. We wanna make sure as we engage our communities, we're really targeting where the problems are, not just coming up with an idea of this is the issue of today. Now, what, where are the numbers? What are we doing? And then we can leverage that partnership because we don't have enough money to do everything we need to do. So if we can identify those key partners, we can amplify those efforts in hopes to try to kind of tackle the, the different issues that are coming up. Because um, if we don't start doing more of that, more of that community embracing, we're going to really see some very negative impacts that will take years to try to overcome because it's happening across, you know, a number of different issues related to health and related to our communities and what's going to be impacting our families. So the more we can engage, the more we can share resources, the better we can really help meet the needs of our communities. We're at a vulnerable state right now. General Arthur General Dean, Arthur you, you can jump in here, please. So you better un unmute there, General, if you could, please, sir. I'm sorry. There we go. That's okay. uh, you know, we, we have two classes of, of, of problems that we have to that we got to deal with. Uh, the one that the doctor was talking about is the is the doctor patient relationship, trying to make sure that a patient doesn't go from using the medicine for medical purposes to abusing it. And then we got the other large group of people who are raiding their family medicine cabinets to abuse these medicines that have never been a patient. So, so we have to put in place strategies to help on the medical side. So we don't want a patient to go from medical use to abuse, but we also want to put in place the appropriate necessary procedures to keep those who are just abusing these because they unfortunately have a substance use disorder and they know that opioids are available and they're going into homes to do it. One of the agencies that we work with across the country are the realtors because when you put a house on the market these days, first thing you have to do is clean out the medicine cabinet because people will go to an open house just to, to steal uh, these medicines. So, so I guess I want us to understand that there's two types, two types of people that we got to deal with. We got to have prevention strategies to keep those who have never been a patient from getting these medicines and abusing them, and that's why the deterral pouch is such a wonderful item to use. And then we have to work with the medical community to make sure that patients don't end up having a problem as well. Okay, and Joe Davis, I saw you just itching to jump in there. Yeah, just, you know, one on a um, very aware of that, uh, that is an issue, something that is we try to educate the families of our Boys and Girls Club members. Um, that's part of that discussion. We have parent nights that are happening within Boys and Girls Clubs where the whole focus of an evening uh, is going to be substance abuse uh, prevention and, and looking and, and making sure that everyone is aware of those factors that the general just mentioned there. Um, also wanted to share earlier, Dr. Uh, Colbeth, you know, I was someone uh, that 20 years ago started having knee surgeries from uh, sports-related accidents, and 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 every surgery I had, I would get 200, uh, you know, opioid um, uh, painkilling pills, and and so um, you know, fortunately, my wife and I uh, were able to dispose of them uh, through proper methods. But it really, I'm really appreciative of the fact that uh, the medical community uh, and maybe being pushed a little bit by um, our lawmakers. 
uh, you know, have, have made it that a much safer um, uh, thing to deal with and that you, when you have a surgery now, you have a two or three day supply and you can kind of take that out of the hand. So, um, you know, that's something that's important, uh, is an important step as we move forward and try to, um, uh, you know, try to limit uh, the exposure and then try to educate as best we can. And that's something that our clubs continue to do uh, with the, particularly with the funding. Um, the Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, uh, last year we um, almost had a bill that came through for two and a half million dollars for opioid prevention abuse. Uh, had, had full support of Dr. Rifke's. We hope to re, um, uh, uh, you know, to re-implement that bill this year. Uh, it's funding that Boys and Girls Clubs would put uh, to very good use and, and would help us have uh, additional staffing dedicated uh, to substance abuse and, and to have the resources uh, necessary to be able to hold those parent nights and to create those mentoring programs that, be, that are able to address all these issues. Well, Joe, that was just a brilliantly crafted handoff back to Representative Colleen Burton, because when something is amiss in Florida, whether it was the original pill mill issue or the proliferation of blue-green algae in the state's freshwater bodies or anything else, people come calling to Tallahassee and say, hey, legislature, you're going to have to help us out here. And talking to, to Kathleen and, and General Dean and Joe Davis, it sounds like this is something else that the legislature, in a year when there is going to be severe constrictions on revenues, we're down already a couple billion dollars, what we saw from the last revenue estimating conference get together. Representative, how do you handle that? Everyone's going to come to the legislature saying, we need help, guys. Come on, you know, get on our team. What can you do, do you think? Well, to, to acknowledge what you just said, as the fact of the matter is, we are going, the, the budget is going to be one of the most difficult budget uh, for sessions that we've had in many, many years because the funding is not going to be available for, quite frankly, everything we'd like to fund. And I think one of the, you know, what's key to this year is that you're, we, are, we are in a pandemic, which is a, an international crisis. I read an article the other day that um, talked about something called crisis fatigue. Right, and the mental health tolls that this that this crisis that the pandemic is having upon everybody, not just in the state of Florida, but quite frankly all, all over the world. And for those individuals who are also challenged with drug addiction or, um, well, opioid addiction, but but all drug addic addictions, it acerbates that. It makes it that much worse. That impacts the rest of their health as well, right? The all the way down the line, it impacts the rest of their lives but certainly impacts their health and impacts the lives and the health of their families as well. So I think one of the challenges we're going to have, and you know, and I'm not the, it's going to be, it's a group project like it always is, right? There will be many voices, not just from Joe and others who are coming to us with great ideas, but within the legislature itself, as you know, there are many voices that will be speaking on this. My voice is going to be what, what should we be doing as a state? And can we take the long view of what's happening? And actually, quite frankly, the bigger picture view of what's happening and how when it comes to addiction and drug abuse, how that impacts somebody's overall health for many, many years of their life, if not their entire life, in addition to the lives of their families. We have to take a big picture view of this. Yeah, I, I, when you mentioned earlier, Tom, how uh, when, when it comes to drug addiction, the point of view of an individual legislator can be very different than, than another based upon, I think, lots of times their life experience. I don't think anymore, and especially this year, I don't think there's a legislator in the state of Florida, if not the country, who can look at any uh, addiction-related issue or mental health-related issue that are acerbated by this pandemic and not accept the fact that these are health issues, these are not somebody's fault because this has happened, this is a, a very, very stressful time in many, many individuals' lives. So there are, there will be some other things that we might like to fund that are good for Florida and good for Floridians. We're going to have to prioritize them. We're going to have to look at what's critical. What do we have to do now? And when we look at issues like drug addiction, we have to look, we have to face the fact. And I think it's going to take some other voices besides clearly mine or even you know from outside the legislature to tell people about the fact that these impact people's overall health. And then for those legislators who just wanna be dollars and cents, right? I'm not one of those people. 
Um, but some people, you, they just look at the dollars and, and cents. All right, gang, let's look at the return on investment, which is not how I like to look at people's lives and people's health always, right? But we have to look at it. We're responsible for money that it's not my checkbook. All right, if we look at that, the return on investment that, that, we, can, that we get out of helping somebody out of a lifetime crisis that is acerbated by a pandemic that has impacted not just their mental health, but the mental health of everybody at varying degrees, right? At varying degrees, um, you know, we should do it. We should do it. We should do what we can. But as you mentioned, I mean, it's gonna be an incredibly difficult budget year and we will we'll just break it down and some things that people might've liked that we did because they were worthwhile. They felt like they were worthwhile. They're going to have to be judged against how do they impact? Do they have statewide impact? And that's a question we asked a few years ago. I've sat on health approach for as many of them on this call probably know for many years now. And a few years ago, we went through an exercise and went through every line and does it have statewide impact? Sadly, this is a statewide impact that we're talking about right now. Sounds like it's going to be a bad session for turkeys. We'll it's it going to be way. a bad and, and, you know, as it should be, <laughs> as it should be. Thanks, Representative. We are now on the final glide path, if you will, to bringing this program to a close. We have not imposed any time limits, but in just one minute, folks, I will give you um, a chance to say whatever you think has gone unsaid in the course of this program. Starting with you, Dr. Greg Colbat, well, what would you like to say in a minute? Just say this uh, program absolutely highlights that this is uh, impacts not only at the local community level, but also state and national. And in the five years that I've kind of done a deep dive on this, I've, I've learned at every single session along the way uh, and the role that we have not only for prevention, but also uh, for treatment and also how this impacts our economic well-being, our mental health well-being and um, you know, the productivity of our society. So this, this is, a, this is a, a, a necessary thing that we all need to be involved with. And it does not, uh, it's, it's not too early to start this discussion. I think Kathleen mentioned that you know, middle schoolers are having issues with this. And uh, the time to talk about this with your kids and your family members is now. Thank you, doctor. And Kathleen Roberts, nice uh, segue to you. Your turn, one minute, please. I think one of the important things to take away from all of this discussion is how critical that prevention element is. Without that, we're never going to be able to have enough funds to support the system. We already know behavioral health is not at the funding capacity that needs to be to really help everybody. And if we keep adding more folks that need help, we're not going to be able to help them out. So if we spend more time on the forefront, every dollar we spend towards prevention can save anywhere from two to $20 on the treatment side, depending on what that looks like. And when we talk prevention, it's not just a program of one program being implemented. That is helping an individual. We need it to also help at the community level. Everything you learn within a program has to be supported by the norms that are taught, the skills that are taught, the beliefs and ideas. And that happens in the community from community environmental strategies. So the work of increasing that knowledge, increasing awareness, providing resources like Deterra, doing things like the drug take back initiatives, being able to be consistent in communication, clear messaging of what is the way we should be doing things, what are the positive norms and moving away from any of those risk factors. That's what we need to really all be working on together to leverage that effort. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, General Arthur Dean, the floor is yours, sir. Yeah, I would simply uh, add to what Kathleen said. Um, um, you know, we tried a few years ago to arrest our way out of this problem, and we know where that got us. We clearly need quality treatment, and we don't have enough treatment, but we can't treat our way out of the problem either. So we really have to put in place strategies at the local level to prevent the problem while understanding and working with our friends in treatment and law enforcement. And if we can do those things, we can begin to get our hands around this. I haven't seen the, the loss uh, since COVID-19, but before COVID-19, these problems were impacting us nationally at the tune of 750 billion dollars a year. I would imagine the problem with COVID-19 going to take it way beyond a trillion dollars. So we can't afford that in Florida. 
nor in the rest of the country. So we've got to put in place strategies to go about preventing this problem while we understand and appreciate the importance of taking care of those who currently have the problem. Some final thoughts, uh, Joe Davis, please. Yeah, I appreciate the general's comments there too. And, and uh, I would just like to say that, that you know, prevention is the key. Um, uh, with Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, a lot of people may not realize it's a lot more than uh, uh, playing basketball in the gym and, and hanging out and, and having dance programs. I mean, Boys and Girls Clubs around the state are uh, definitively uh, putting uh, uh, prevention programs into place that are addressing the issues of substance abuse and o opioid abuse uh, in, in uh, every way that we can. We're working with kids, we're working with families, we're working with communities, we're working with schools, um, making sure that everyone has the information that they need to be successful. And we appreciate the opportunity to be able to serve youth, uh, uh, particularly our teens and, and uh, our middle school kids and our high school kids um, in a manner uh, that, that gives them support, uh, that gives them the opportunity to have a caring adult uh, in their life in a very safe place um, uh, with an eye on a future career path, which means that um, they know how to avoid um, uh, tricky things like substance abuse. Uh, they have the nutrition uh, that they need uh, and they have the academic support that they need to be successful. And so Boys and Girls Clubs are really proud to be a part of the economic recovery process of Florida and we're happy to be a part of these conversations. Thank you, Joe. And in so many regards, the legislature always gets the last word. So Representative Colleen Burton, it's all yours for a final, final comment, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. Key takeaway from me, and I hope from anybody who listens to this program, is we cannot do this alone. The Boys and Girls Club cannot do it alone. Individual physicians cannot do it alone. You know, the general cannot do it alone. Kathleen's organization, we cannot do this alone. And it, that's the key to solving a lot of problems. But when it comes to this problem in particular, you know, for somebody like me who really has, a, there's a limited role that the legislature, that, that government plays in this. And that's clear from today's conversation. So I leave the conversation feeling um, reassured that we've got a great team on the ground all in, in this country, but every each person on your panel touches somebody differently, yet we all touch each other and we all touch the same people sometimes, right? And so for me, it, it makes my job um, a little easier, not necessarily easy, but easier knowing that I have all these individuals out there that I can call upon that I could get expert advice from, right? Because they're, they're boots on the ground. They're the boots on the ground in this, in this battle. And I feel I'm their support. And I look forward to continue to do that for them. Thank you, Representative Colleen Burton of Polk County. And thanks also to Kathleen Roberts, Executive Director, Community Coalition Alliance, General Arthur Dean of CADCA, the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, Joe Davis from Florida Alliance of Boys and Girls Clubs, and Dr. Greg Colbath, orthopedic surgeon for Spartanburg, South Carolina. Thank you all for being on Perspectives today for a great conversation, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Perspectives you. produced by WFSU Public Media in Tallahassee. Thanks going out to Taylor Cox, Paul Dam, Amy Diaz de Villegas, Devin Bittner, Tricia Moynihan, and Lydell Rawls, our director of content and executive producer, Kim Kelling. I'm Tom Flanagan. Next week, we'll get an update on what's going on at Tallahassee's Innovation Park. Seems there's a lot of new developments, and we'll talk about it next week right here on Perspectives from WFSU Public Media. Take care.